The month of June is huge for elite athletes around the country to take official visits. And Charles Lester III, King Joseph Edwards, and Miles Lockhart are three players who recently scheduled to take official visits to Ohio State this summer. You are Locked On Buckeyes, your daily podcast on the Ohio State Buckeyes. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, Buckeye fans? Welcome back to another episode of Locked On Buckeyes, part of Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, Jay Stevens, also the host of the Jay Stevens Podcast. It is Wednesday, February 15th in the year 2023, and this episode is brought to us by our good friends at FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. Joining us once again, it's been quite a few weeks since John Garcia Jr. has been with us. John is Locked On's football recruiting insider. John, the last time John and I were together, we didn't get to talk about one really talented corner, one of the best in the country in the class of 2024. But today is a day to go over him and a few other guys who have scheduled official visits at Ohio State in the month of June. John, welcome back to the podcast. Good to be back on with you, Jay. Yeah, it's uh, it's ramping up, right? 2024 is uh, hitting in full swing and from a recruiting perspective. And obviously, Ohio State is going to be at the forefront of crafting uh, how that storyline unfolds. So it looks like June is going to be a big factor for sure. June is always a big month for the official visits. And before we get into these athletes, John, why is June that month for why all these elite athletes and just guys trying to get some attention from college coaches flock to these universities in the month of June? Well, you got a lot going on and it all overlaps, right? You've got the very early renditions of the summer workouts, uh, the current players that are on their, their summer sessions. And then of course you've got the camps going on, right? So a lot of prospects are flocking to go try to earn scholarship offers. Um, and then on the back end, of course, you have the official visit window. This is a time where a lot of schools don't have a ton going on beyond the camps. So they're able to pour more into the visits and, and spend more time with the prospective student athletes. And on top of that, it lines up really well from a timeline perspective. I know we'll talk about it a little bit today, but a lot of these players, a lot of the blue chip players want to have their decision in by the end of, of the summer. So summer official visits have become even more critical on the path towards locking in a college decision before these these seniors begin their final high school football season. So it overlaps quite well for every school and Ohio State is one that is already planning on taking advantage. The month of June, I have seen, especially last year, as I've gotten kind of paid more attention to the month of June, there's, there tends to be one weekend, John, where these athletes, the elite athletes, the elite of the elite, flock to different universities and certain schools try to have a big weekend where they can get all of the top talent in Columbus or Tuscaloosa or Athens all at once. And it seems like June 16th through the 18th, from the stuff I've seen, it seems to be that weekend. Um, one athlete we're not going to talk about specifically, KJ Bolden. It's I believe he's scheduled an official visit during this same week. What does that do for a guy like a Charles Lester or a King Joseph Edwards or even a KJ Bolden? What does it do to get them on campus with other kids who are some of the best at their positions in the entire country? Well, look, it, it offers you a time to to kind of galvanize, right? You, you're not. Those 48 hours on campus on Ohio State's dime are great for everybody, but you you want to create as much overlap as possible with the recruiting pitches and even some of the events and dinners and other situations that you've got going on. Uh, if, if it's a time of year where the student body isn't there in full force, you're not building around a game, right, like in the month of June. So you want to create a little bit of, you know, a, an intimate community with uh, recruits and their families. I think that's an important part to remember. It's it's the families, not just the recruits that are able to make these trips. So these dinners, these events, these these coaching sessions, this, this teaching tape, whatever it is, it's not just an, an audience of one there. So you start to pair elite recruits together. Now their families can start to mingle a little bit. And oftentimes that really does play an impact in some of these final decisions, uh, whether it's 
hey, one kid committed early. Now you're trying to bring in the other recruit that you met on the visit or, you know, you're apexing towards a decision together and you can maybe compare notes on certain schools. It really does a factor importantly down the line. And then from the recruiting perspective, these kids all follow each other. They know each other. They're aware of each other. Um, and you mentioned a couple from the state of Georgia in particular making visits the same weekend. I'm sure KJ and, and King Joseph have overlapped uh, a plenty beyond the Friday night lights. So uh, I think that always factors in uh, as well. I believe they're teammates actually uh, on Friday nights as well. So that, that really can't be understated in terms of how important it could be towards uh, a given recruiting weekend. So trying to pair them up and make it one huge splash weekend is something that every program tries to do in the spring, in the summer, and of course, you know, during the season relative to their schedule. Before getting to the three athletes who have been scheduled, who have scheduled three of their official visits at in Columbus, who are the focus for today's show, I'd like to thank LinkedIn Jobs for being the official college football and college basketball recruiting sponsor across the Locked On Podcast Network. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high-stakes wager for your small business. That's why LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Terms and conditions apply. I mentioned it earlier, this young man from Sarasota, Florida, Rivers, Riverview High School, Charles Lester the Third. John, I love one thing. I love, and it, John, I say it all the time. I love guys that maybe either play multiple sports or they play one sport. They play multiple positions. See it in baseball. You see a guy who pitcher, maybe shortstop, second base, and he might be able to play a little outfield as well. But generally, the pitcher can play a little bit of that middle infield. You get some guys on the football field. Might be a receiver. Might be a corner. Guy and a couple guys at Ohio State, one going to the NFL. Dewan Jones played basketball and football in high school. JT Tuamalowell, basketball and football in high school. This young man, Charles Lester III, he's not one of a multi sport athlete, but you could categorize him as an athlete because, John, I saw that he's played corner, wide receiver, and wildcat quarterback. I doubt they'll use the wildcat at, in Columbus. But with Brian Hartline as the OC, you never know what's going to happen. When you hear Charles Lester the third his name and you watch him play the football, what pops into your head? Uh, just production. Um, he can do a little bit of everything. Every year there seems to be a Floridian that you can kind of line him up wherever you want on the field, and, and he'll make things happen. And Charles has that cachet attached to his name. Uh, certainly, you know, enough of a, a body of work at receiver to be a power five guy um, could probably factor in, into the return game as well. Uh, very fast, very comfortable with the football in the air. But again, when you translate that to the next level, you have even more upside with those traits on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, so he's going to be one of those elite uh, type cornerback recruits. Uh, and, and his recruitment is, is really blown up in the last year because of it, whether it's a seven on seven, certainly Friday nights or somewhere in between, Lester is, is a head turner. He, he commands attention and he backs it up thereafter. So, yeah, he's become uh, a premier cornerback in this class, you know, very much a blue chip recruit, probably flirting with a fifth star, depending on where you look. And it's for a reason. He's got the requisite length, explosiveness, and he tracks and plays the football as well as any corner in this class. And in this day and age, it's that trait that separates the good from the great. Uh, and that's why his offer list is crazy. And his group of really finalists is a who's who list. It's not just Ohio State. It's it's Georgia. It's Alabama. It's Clemson. It's Florida. Florida State uh, for the Floridian, you know, schools you would expect. And then the heavyweights nationally that have really thrived uh, in secondary recruiting. So Lester's recruitment will be fascinating. And I believe Ohio State is the first official that he is set to this point. So certainly the Buckeyes continue to have his attention. We always talk about John, how sometimes in recruiting the last visit means if you could, you could really knock out of the park or lay an egg. What does that first visit mean for a young guy who this summer is going to go on the camp circuit and the first official visit on the school's dime is Ohio state. What does that mean for his recruitment? Well, it's the table setter uh, until until we hear otherwise, right? So if it is the first visit, it'll be the one that that sets the bar. It'll be the one that establishes the precedent to which he views 
the ensuing official visits. You you want to be first or last usually in this conversation. And really with a, a, a blue chip DB like that, who doesn't have like a concrete timetable for a decision, a concrete plan, the other trips aren't set. You kind of got to grab the visits whenever possible. So mm-hmm. I'm sure Ohio State presented this great weekend in June, and he obviously bought into it and, and is now scheduled to make this trip. So we think it'll be the first visit. It could end up being one of many uh, during the offseason, but with that type of talent, you you don't want to deny him uh, any weekend that he wants to come up and, and check out Columbus, and this will be a return trip for him. So I think that is really critical in evaluating what, what this visit could mean because now – you're not really focused on the surface level stuff, right? It's not about the shoe. It's not about the putting on the jersey. It's not about just kind of the the atmosphere in Columbus in general. It's more about the intricacies. It's more about the coaching staffs, the academics, your family, how they feel about it. It becomes more intimate. And that's what you want from an official visit. You don't want to have to discover too much on that type of trip. There, there has to be some balance between discovery and really enjoyment and I think Ohio State's going to be able to get that with a lot of these guys because they've already been to Columbus previously. So for Lester, you're going to take a trip as much as wherever you can get it because if you look at the schools that are in on him, I listed more than five, yeah. which means one of these schools isn't going to get an official right. visit out of him. So just to be a confirmed OV, no matter where it's positioned, is a pretty important deal in this recruitment. Last thing on Lester, what's a huge strength of his and what's a what's something that can be classified as a weakness? Playing the ball at the catch point. I mean, that's that's as important a trait as there is for a cornerback or any defensive back, uh, especially nowadays, because it's tough, right? It gets harder to play in the secondary. I mean, look what we saw in the Super Bowl. Uh, something so small uh, could really tip the scales one way or the other. So I would say when the ball is in the air, his patience, his length, his ability to track the football is is really elite uh, and effortless, instinctive even. Uh, and I think on the flip side, because he does so many things so well, Jay, it's about the polish. It's about yeah. the technique. Can you maintain leverage? Can you push your pedal, not fall step? All the little things that every DB needs to work on really from a daily basis, I think you need to add to Charles Lester's game. But the thought is once he does get to college, focusing on just one spot for the first time in his football life, a lot of that stuff, that technical uh, increase will come uh, with time uh, early on in his collegiate career. But right now, that's really where his game is at. But again, there's there's not a lot of holes. I'm, I'm really nitpicky here trying to figure out where to go with Charles Lester. He's he's that impressive every time we see him. That's a good sign. I know Buckeye fans want better play out of the cornerback position. And you just making that final line is something I'm sure they'll love if Lester decides to commit to, to Ohio State in the near future. Second one, you mentioned him earlier, teammates with K.J. Bolden. King Joseph Edwards. Talk about a guy in Lester, Charles Lester, that plays multiple positions on the football field. King Joseph Edwards is one of those multi-sport athletes. John, I saw he plays basketball. His sophomore year, he threw the shot put and ran sprints at 6'5", 242. That's a big boy to be running around that track. On the football field specifically, though, John, what do you like about him? He's interesting, right? This is a modern edge rusher, like you mentioned. He's got the frame to line up on the outside and and really put pressure on offensive tackles, but he's got this twitch and speed on top of it to where he can play a little bit smaller. Usually we talk about guys playing bigger. King Joseph can play a little bit smaller, and that's a huge advantage for him coming off the edge. Uh, He had a big injury this past year, had surgery in August, but he's now rounding back into shape. We've seen him a little bit on the seven-on-seven circuit, playing some tight end even. So this is another (laughs) multi-sport, multi-faceted athlete that you just kind of want to see sink his teeth into one position when he gets to college for good. But there's no doubt when you talk about upside, it's going to be on the defensive front. And that's why his recruitment has really, really blown up Uh, since last offseason. He was kind of the young, flashy underclassman at all these events and backed it up with his spring play uh, to the point where his offer list just went national uh, almost overnight. Um, So now he's still reaping some of those benefits, even though we missed so much of, of his junior season. So he's healthy. He's looking to bounce back on the field, but he's so talented and coveted that his recruitment literally never 
missed a beat to the point where he's still taking a bunch of visits. And now obviously he's scheduling official visits with Ohio state, grabbing one of them. Very important because this is a kid who has wanted literally coast to coast. I mean, USC has gotten him on campus for multiple visits, uh, Texas. He's been down to Miami all the way up and down the East coast, uh, as well as that big 10 footprint. So this will be a true national, uh, you know, plant the flag type of recruitment where whoever wins it is going to feel much better about their overall prospects. In addition to just uh, grabbing a, a true blue chip pass rusher. I did read John. I didn't see much in via my eyes on just watching different clips, but I read that some people believe at least there's one scout believes that when it comes to King Joseph in college, he might be able to play a stand up, maybe three, four outside backer role. Uh, maybe good in a two point stance. Now, Ohio State is not your traditional three, four, but they have, they're looking to try to get a hybrid linebacker D lineman type. Is that something that you think King Joseph could flourish at at the next level? Absolutely. You know, he's got untapped athleticism. Uh, like we said, he's finally healthy now, but we see so much. Uh, stand up from him already, whether it's at, at, at the camp circuit, seven on seven, whatever it is, we already see him doing some of those things um, to supplement his Friday night game. So once he gets back healthy, I think you get the full array in 2023. Uh, you can move him around. He can play inside or outside, certainly stand up or put his hand in the dirt and have relatively similar success. So it's going to be interesting to see how his frame, you know, fills out though. Like you said, six, five, 240 already coming off of that injury, you know, how much more room is there to, for him to fill out before he gets to college? That will be kind of its own conversation with his game. Uh, but you can't deny the twitch, the speed, uh, and the production. You know, you, you can't have enough pass rushers, uh, whether they're stand-up or hand-in-the-dirt there at the end of the day. So he'll remain coveted throughout. When it comes to the best spot for him, now we know what he can play the two, be in a two-point stance, more outside back or hybrid role. Is he better standing up or better hand in the ground? I think right now hand in the ground. Uh, you know, he's he's one who he, he already has uh, so much torque and explosiveness. But typically when you got your hand in the dirt, Jay, you're you're playing the leverage game already, right? Because yeah. you're in your three-point stance. You're leaning on the hand that is in that theoretical dirt. So it helps you stay low more times than not. And you mentioned his track background. Same principles apply there. So I kind of vision him that way, especially – considering he's already 240 um you know going into his his final off season in high school you don't you don't want to ask a lot of teenagers to stay trim to stay kind of in their same ballpark typically you want to leave room for them to add weight so if that's the case he's probably going to have his hand in the dirt anyway so whether it's right now or certainly looking forward i think he's a hand in the dirt player but early on again athletic and long enough to absolutely play comfortably in a two point stance and be similarly effective you know, um, last thing on him, I used to throw shot put, and I will say this, I was not really good, John, not good at all. Um, if I told you uh, the distance that I threw the shot put and threw the discus, you would say, yeah, Jay, you were not really good. That's a great assessment of, of you. But I do know this, though, about that sport, those two throws. Explosion is key. And I think when I see him hand in the ground, dirt, in pass rush drills, may it be at the Under, Arm Under Armour All-American camp or other camps that are around the circuit, around the country, I see explosion. And that's one thing I like about him is you're not trying to teach him to explode off the ball immediately. He's already figured out how to do that. And there's a consistency while doing that very thing. So he's found a way to transfer the explosion needed in the shot put throw to the football field. And these are two different motions. One, your hand never hits the ground unless it's a fault, but you never hit the ground when you are in the ring spinning to throw that, to throw the shot put. Well, same thing in football, like it's a different motion, but being able to transfer the explosion from the shot put throw and make that a, a consistent thing on the football field at D end. That's one thing I understand that Larry Johnson would love. And people have said Ohio State's missed out on some of these big defensive ends, specifically recruits. I'm not going to count Larry Johnson out, John. I'm not going to say Larry Johnson's not going to cannot find a way to win this recruit over. Because this is a guy that if he gets in to Columbus and Larry Johnson is there year two, year three, keep that same explosion, watch out because he could shake up things in college football. Absolutely. Um you really can't deny uh, his lower body explosion. And as you mentioned, 
those other sports um, and scenarios create more understanding of your own body, your, your motor control, your body control, your balance, all of yeah. those things are paramount. And again, you look at the best defensive linemen at any level, all those boxes are, are checked in Sharpie. So I do think that that King's on his way. And that's why even without game tape for 12 months, yeah. his recruitment is still very much Ohio State, USC, Georgia, the the, the biggest and, and, and best schools in the country relative to the position or otherwise. So there's a reason that nobody slowed down, even, even with all the time off. Last but not least, the goal for today was to get through all three athletes. Last time we had John on, we got, to th- we got through two or three because I got kind of excited and just kept on rolling with those two guys. But Miles Lockhart from ba- Basha High School, I believe, in Chandler, Arizona. Another athlete, but I believe, John, he specifically plays cornerback, if that's correct. Five foot ten, about 185 pounds. I believe Chandler, Arizona is where... Dylan Rayola plays football. Am I, am I, is those two things correct? Is that the right connection? Yeah, I think I think uh, Rayola just moved to Pinnacle High School, but okay, same area. Um, so yeah, there's some crossover here. What do you like about Miles Lockhart? This guy, he's last on the list today, but he's still talented, like the other other two guys are. He brings a lot to the table, Jay. I think he's got, uh, like you said, he's a, he's an athlete, two way guy. So some of the same things we said about Charles Lester do factor in here in terms of just his understanding of the football and how, how to track it, which again is, is something that just, it really can't be understated. I mean, watch the Super Bowl, how AJ Brown tracked the football and yes. reeled in that yes. long touchdown uh, from Jalen hurts. I mean, that's just not something every human being can do. No. AJ Brown pro baseball draftee as an outfielder. So what do they do? Track the football really well. So I think players who can do that, uh, I just give them the benefit of the doubt more times than not. But behind that, just like Lester, there's a lot of raw athleticism here too uh, w- when you look at this Arizona native. So I like that about him. But I think he's a little bit more polished. He's a little okay. further along okay. than a Charles Lester just from a technical perspective. Very good at maintaining his leverage. I saw him speed turn on tape. That does not happen a lot on Friday nights. So not a lot of high schoolers know – to speed turn to win back the leverage after they've lost it. I've seen this kid do it on tape. So there's a lot of polish, I think, in his game. And we're seeing that a lot from from the state of Arizona. It's becoming uh, another area where you've really got to pay attention because there's more and more talent coming out. Um, So for every Dylan Rayola, there are players on the other side of the ball making their own uh, level of noise here. So, yeah, another one who's going to see Ohio State, who's been there before. I believe this is actually going to be his third visit up to Columbus. So you feel really good uh, about the Bucks chances, especially considering a lot of schools involved here are West Coast, as you would imagine, right? Arizona yeah. native. So you've got Washington in there. You've got Utah in there, a couple other schools. Ohio State kind of feels like it's on an island here. So um, naturally, you're not competing with the same, t- you know, s- the same type of schools, schools with a similar trajectory, uh, or even part of the country from a geographical standpoint. So I think those are good things for Ohio State to present something different than uh, kind of living in the Pac-12 bubble uh, that this kid came up in. I did read when it comes to Lockhart, and last thing with him for time's sake, I did read that he they, this scout believes – that Lockhart is best and he's most comfortable near the sideline. Specifically, may it be lining up. That's more where his bread and butter is. I know players will transition and players will progress and coaches will try to groom players and develop players where they think the the player suits fits best on the football field. So I understand all the things that may happen at the next level. But when it comes to maybe where you view him being the best, is it a side of the field? Is it in um, um, tracking the ball? What area of the field that do you find that he is the best at? I like his off-ball ability. Miles is is really comfortable at the line of scrimmage, and he can certainly play, um, you know, near the LOS and and compete and maybe intimidate along the way. But he, you know, he's 5'10", 180 with good speed, good instincts, and good technique. Typically, those are the players that you want to live off the football and allow that technique and those instincts to combine to where you're not only playing a receiver, but you're reading the quarterback simultaneously. You're you're not in a lot of systems nowadays, Jay, playing a ton of man coverage, right? Because every quarterback seems to be mobile. Um, All these receivers are getting uh, craftier, and there's more pass catchers on the field 
than ever before. So a lot of teams are, are having almost by default to play a lot of underneath and or zone coverage. So that's exactly where I, I think Miles could work best. He's got the discipline and the technique to play a lot of man to man, but really he shines where his football IQ and athleticism can kind of combine uh, against uh, a quarterback. So I think that's where I'd probably prefer him most. But in general, moving from high school to college, you're going to play a little bit of everything, right? Because every game plan, every opponent, down distance, circumstance, package, all those things are going to demand, you know, different situations. So I do think he's got an all around enough of a game to play anywhere uh, from a cornerback perspective. But I really like his ability off the football. John, it's good to have you back. It's always fun talking ball with you, recruiting a little NFL Super Bowl thrown in there as well. You if you go. could, John, let everyone know where they can follow you on Twitter in case they want to follow you along as you cover these elite recruits all around the country. Yeah, real simple. It's just my name, John Garcia underscore JR. And, of course, you could catch me uh, throughout the Locked On Network. And, guys, you can follow me on Twitter at jsteven07. Send all of your emails to jsteven317 at gmail.com. Love having John on. Love getting John's insight. Got through all three guys today. Not sure what's going to, what we're going to talk about the next time John comes on, but you want to stay tuned. Recruiting updates with John are amazing, and he provides you with the information you want to know about players who might be Buckeyes in the future. John Garcia Jr., thanks for coming back on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Anytime, my friend. Thanks for having me.